I'm Baron. I'm a product design manager at Replit. And if you're not familiar with Replit, our mission is to empower the next billion software creators. Now, you might ask, okay, what does that mean? Uh, we make a collaborative programming environment. It's an all-in-one software creation tool. You can write code in any language. You can collaborate live with others, just like on Google Docs or Figma. You can deploy production applications and use AI and do it all from your browser or desktop app or a mobile app. You can kind of think of it like Figma and VS Code combined with Heroku. If you are familiar with it, I'm curious, show of hands, who here has used Replit before? Okay, nice. Next year, I want to see like everyone's hand go up. You might be familiar with it as a place that people learn how to code. They start their programming journey. And that is true. It's a really good place for people to learn how to code because we create a development environment for you from scratch. You don't have to worry about installing Python, Node, configuring your environment, any of that. But the past three years, we've also spent a lot of effort building much more powerful features into the product. We've increased the storage limit, the amount of RAM and CPU you get. We've added the ability to deploy production applications, adding custom dev tools, import from GitHub, adding databases directly into the product, and a laundry list of other improvements. But what I'm gonna share today is our journey, the past couple of years, discovering that just adding power to a developer tool is not enough. We're gonna start the journey with layout. This is what Replit looked like in 2020. We had a single code file on the left and an output on the right. It was very simple, deliberately minimalistic, and it was really good for learners because there was really not that much to get confused. You typed code on the left, you saw it happened on the right. The longer we sat with this simple layout, the more we got feature requests from more advanced users, people who started to hit the limits of Replit, people who wanted to do more powerful things, and personally, as a team of designers, developers, tool makers, we were also frustrated with the simplicity. People wanted to be able to see multiple tabs side by side. People wanted to be able to split the screen vertically instead of horizontally. People wanted to control much more of what we could offer. And so by early 2021, we knew that we really needed to invest in the layout system to avoid people graduating off the platform. The biggest choice at the time was whether we wanted to port VS Code or not. If you're not familiar with VS Code, it's probably the most popular development environment on the planet. I think it's got more than 15 million installs. It's made by Microsoft. And a lot of the popular editors out there today port the VS Code engine. GitHub Code Spaces, Cursor, Code Sandbox, a lot of others. And there's a lot of really clear benefits to this. First of all, you have an entire ecosystem of developers who are already used to the tool. They know how to use it. They know where to find things. They know how it works. There's an entire extensions ecosystem that's very mature. It's also, for us, it would be less work for the engineers. We wouldn't have to build all of this from scratch and we could leverage what VS Code has already built and open sourced. At the time, we had to decide kind of what mattered to us and what would help us make the decision. And there were two things that really became clear as we thought about our users. The first was something we called mouse feel. Now, if you watch a professional developer like using their environment, they probably won't touch a mouse at all the entire time they work. They're navigating with keyboard shortcuts that they've learned over the years. They, you could probably throw their mouse away and like it wouldn't make a difference for their productivity. But if you watch new developers and people that are learning for the first time how to program, they rely really heavily on using their mice. They select text, they navigate, they click around, and a lot of the existing layout tools that VS Code offered were really built for keyboard shortcuts and keyboard control. But we really wanted to make sure the experience of using your mouse to control the layout was as easy as possible. The other thing that we cared a lot about at the time was flexibility and pure optionality for the future. 
we knew that we didn't just want to be a code editor for the foreseeable future. We knew that we wanted to offer deployments, databases, all sorts of other kind of services. And so the choice to port VS Code would have also, it would have saved us some time, but it would have also locked us into how they build their UI. And so early 21, we spent three months building a layout system from scratch. Uh, there are some horror stories and there are some prototypes that will never see the light of day. Uh, you can come talk to me about the in infinite canvas version after. Um, but we spent a lot of time really focusing on the details for mouse interactions. Uh, so when you're dragging tabs around and panes around, visually previewing where things will land so you have a clear sense of what the layout is gonna be as you're kind of navigating. And also even just visually indicating when something is gonna like pop in or out of the layout depending on how far you've dragged it. And this was really nice because new users didn't have to learn keyboard shortcuts. People could just intuitively pick it up uh, and use it. And Validatingly enough, a lot of these patterns have been, have been borrowed by other editors since. The second thing that we really focused on was the key kind of flexibility of the layout system. We built it in a very modular way in that you could put any tool anywhere you wanted in the editor. The simple layout that was good for learners is still very easy to create. You have code on the left and output on the right. But we also unlocked this more advanced use case where you could have a preview of your application, you could have a database you're managing, you could have modular apps and extensions. And what this allowed us to do in the future is design new tools almost as like desktop apps or mobile apps um, that could be slotted in wherever they made sense. Now, when we started to release the more advanced layout, we saw people making more advanced projects on Replit we saw more adoption for larger web apps, uh, bigger projects, APIs, et cetera. And the more advanced projects that we saw on the platform, the more it revealed other holes in the way that we kind of designed the tool to begin with. So I'm curious, raise your hand if you've had to work with TCP or IP ports in the past. Okay, small audience. I'm jealous for all of you who did not raise your hand and I hope you never have to. Um, they're kind of like mailboxes. They tell computers where the right application is on the website that you're visiting. And this is what they look like. They're uh, an address and a port number. And historically, we would automatically display the first port that your process opened, so you didn't have to configure like anything related to ports. For most simple applications, if you spin up a React app, a Next app, et cetera, it's kind of a magical experience. So you could just go on Replit, spin an app up out of the blue, click run, and get an immediate working preview. You don't have to worry about localhost, you don't have to worry about browser setup, any of that. But as we started to see more advanced projects, we started to realize this approach of like doing some magic on your behalf has pretty clear drawbacks. There's no guarantee that the first port that opens, especially if you're running an API, a backend, processes, a front end, all in the same container, but the first port is gonna be the website. And so we saw a lot of examples like this where you're running a project and what we would show you is actually like the API result. You'd see like a 403 or JSON returned from some other process when what you're expecting to see is the website or app that you're building. And so the obvious answer for us at the time was, okay, let's just add more configuration. Let's allow users to change what port they're previewing so they can switch between APIs, web applications, they can kind of see it all. And we built a pretty advanced networking tool directly into Replit so that you could get a visualization of all the ports that are open, where they're forwarded, you could preview them, you could kind of turn them off, et cetera. And what we realized when we started to roll it out is that it was really great for experts. Devin here is a platform engineer. Uh, on Replit, who's basically a wizard. But it was a little harder for amateurs to understand. It's jargony, you might not have heard of ports before, uh, and it's another thing to learn when you're trying to get started. And 
one thing we realized at the time is it's very easy to trick yourself into thinking that these little bits of complexity are actually not that hard to learn, right? Like, especially if you're working with tool builders and engineers who have the context already, a common thing we would kind of think or hear or debate is like, oh, well, if you're building web apps, you're gonna have to learn about ports eventually, so this is not making your experience that much more complicated. But all of those little pieces of complexity that you might take for granted really stack up, especially for new users. And so that divide became much clearer the more power we added to the platform. Even though the tool was universal, or was general, it wasn't universal to the audiences that we were trying to attract. The more power we added to the tool, the wider the range of requests we would see from our community was. We would see a ton of requests from new users for things like WYSIWYG editing, drag and drop UI, things that other apps like Webflow or Wix or Squarespace really pioneered. And those were pretty easy for us to say like, you know, there are other tools that are gonna do that better. We're not gonna need to support that. But we really wanted the more advanced features. We would hear requests for like custom Tailwind LSP suggestions, better SSH support, custom LSP installations. And that was resonant for us because we also wanted a lot of those features personally. We wanted to build more advanced things on the platform. And so the bar for us internally for whether the application was powerful enough was whether we could run Replit on Replit. We spent half a year of really intense work focusing on like burning down all of the little details that made running Replit on Replit impossible. And we eventually got to a point where you could open Replit, click a button, and spin up an instance of Replit immediately and run Replit entirely on Replit. We had to build Redis directly into the infrastructure. We had to add bigger machines. We had to copy a lot of files on write instead of copying them directly. Uh, it was a lot of effort, but we finally got to a place that we were proud of. And interestingly, even once we got it working, engineers didn't use it day to day. This was kind of a surprise. We basically discovered that on the spectrum of novice to advanced requests, the right edge in extends to infinity. There's no, there's no limit there. We would solve one problem, we would solve TypeScript LSP, we would solve SSH, and then there would be another request. Custom uh, shell aliases, dot files, and even if we had gone infinitely into the future and solved all of those problems, it was really unclear whether that was ever going to be enough to get professional engineers to use the tool. Another barrier that we realized we were facing is that tooling, especially among engineers, is like a very social and uh, like professional point of pride. If you have spent a lot of time building your own custom key bindings for Vim or aliases or dot files, getting you to switch not only means you have to replicate all of the features, but it also means you're kind of giving up a bit of social pride. There is a little bit of pride of doing things the hard way. It's especially impressive if you see like an engineer kind of like whipping through the commands line, uh, like throwing commands left and right, and you're just trying to figure out what they're doing and how they're doing it. It, it feels powerful when you're using your tools that way. But at the same time, an interesting thing started happening, we started observing other roles around software engineers who just wanted to be able to make things quickly, just wanted to be able to make quick changes, really adopting the tool much more actively than engineers who we were originally kind of hoping would adopt it. We would see PMs using it to learn to code and prototype their own ideas, designers jumping straight into Replit to prototype things instead of tools like Origami or Protopie, and especially kind of indie developers, founders, people who are scrappy and just need to build something and they don't have the same social stigma for the tools that they're using. This coincided really nicely with the wave of LLMs, generative AI the past couple of years because it really lowered the barrier for people to learn how to build specific kinds of software. And so what we missed for a year or two probably is that just in focusing in on pure power and pure capabilities, 
we missed that the sweet spot for the product was like actually much further to the left. I guess the left is this way on stage. Um, than on the advanced side. This was a tweet that we saw, I think, about a year ago that really resonated because the behavior that we saw is that it, the tool made non-programmers into programmers. Um, you would come to the tool as like a designer, a PM, maybe someone who doesn't have a lot of experience, and you would become a programmer almost accidentally. And so this introduced some painful questions for us. We had made the tool much, much more powerful, but like, was it actually enough to get people to adopt it and use it? If you're familiar with this idea from operating system design, worse is better. It's the Wikipedia description behind me, but what it basically suggests is that limited but simple tools are much more easy to adopt and share and disseminate in a market than tools that are extremely powerful, but have a lot of complexity. And so the question that we kind of had to answer is like, well, who are we making tools for and what do we care about? Are we building tools for the professional that needs the most advanced configuration and the most detailed specifications? Or are we building tools for the rest of us, most of the world, people who just want to create something and don't necessarily need or want all the configuration and power. We return to our mission statement at this point. There's a very deliberate choice to frame it as empowering the next billion software creators and not software engineers or developers because we really think the ability to make software is much wider than just the engineering field. But, it was a pretty painful pill to swallow, especially as tool makers. A lot of the people at Replit, and I'm sure a lot of the people in this room, really like making tools and obsessing over the quality of tools. I'm excited to go to the teenage engineering talks, the linear talks, because of this. And the hard part for all of us was like, we're kind of like sushi chefs trying to sell and make sushi knives, but at some point, we had to kind of step back and admit maybe there's more value in our product to the market as something simpler, cheaper, more accessible, kind of like, you know, Ikea knives instead of a thousand dollar sushi knife. And so the question that we still haven't figured out, but that I want to kind of leave everyone here with is, if you build more power into your product, who is going to come to the product and why are they going to use it? Now, we're still figuring this out. We're still on a journey here of discovery. If you come tune in next year, we might have a much more specific answer, a better answer for you. And this journey looks different for every product, but I hope what we've shared kind of helps you think differently about how to add power and more advanced features to products, especially developer tools. So thanks for listening. If you have questions, come find me on the internet. Come find me in person. And otherwise, have a great config.